on it. at Brigham Young University, where he teaches undergraduate courses in introductory biology, evolutionary biology, and evolutionary medicine. He is a United States representative to the Scientific Council on Antarctic Research and has had continuous NSF support for his research since 2002, including most notably the McMurdo Dry Valley Long-Term Ecological Research Project. He has also led projects during that tenure in the Beardmore and Shackleton Glacier regions of the Trans-Antarctic Mountains. His research program in evolutionary ecology focuses on how organisms, communities, and ecosystems respond to extreme environments and climate-driven change. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Byron Adams. Thank you very much. And I'm gonna talk about the charismatic megafauna of continental Antarctica. And I, I hope to impress you with some of these organisms we're going to talk about tonight. Um, the outline for the presentation tonight is what is the LTER. I'm going to start that first, start out, start out with that. And then I'm going to talk about why you should care about the stuff I'm going to talk about today. And then I'm going to talk about what are the charismatic megafauna of Antarctica. And then I'm going to talk about what makes these animals so awesome. And then I'm going to talk about what happened to these animals during the ice ages, right? It's somewhat controversial as to, as to what happened to these organisms during the ice ages. So we're trying to clarify that a little bit. And so that's the outline. So I'm starting out with the LTER. LTER stands for Long-Term Ecological Research. And the site that's here in the McMurdo Dry Valleys is one of a whole bunch. See, most of them are scattered throughout North America. Uh, there's some up here uh, in upper parts of North America in Alaska. There's some in Morea, uh, out, in, uh, out in the middle of the ocean, quite a beautiful one. And then there are two in Antarctica, one in, one in McMurdo and one in Palmer. And the idea here is to do lots of awesome ecosystem science and to monitor parts of our planet as they experience um, climatic changes. And so these grants are funded there with lots of foresight, the idea that ecosystems tend to respond fairly slowly. It's not like a normal science project where you just go out, go to the lab, get some dough, and do some experiments, and then tell the world what you found. You know, like when you do manipulations to an ecosystem, it takes a while for things to respond, right? It takes a while for like trees to grow and stuff, right? And so in their foresight in the late 1980s, early parts of the 80s actually, the National Science Foundation was convinced by the ecologists they needed to start looking at some of these things over longer periods of time. And so uh, the LTER project is funded in six-year cycles, and, and every third year into each cycle, we have a very extensive review, a site review. We have one of those coming up next year where we bring down the world's smartest people, and they criticize our science and tell us what sucks and tell us to get in gear and fix some things up. We try and impress them, and hopefully we can get our funding renewed each year. Um, but we do science uh, on long-term and short-term experiments, so we do some manipulations that we hope to, look, to yield results in six years, although much of the work that we do, I like to say that a lot of the data that we generate are to answer questions that have not yet been asked, right? Sort of like that one dude who started measuring carbon dioxide in the atmosphere back in who knows way back when, was not really thinking, oh, I'm gonna start a climate change experiment, right? That we, we are measuring things, hopefully, that generations from now, people can use our data in order to make inferences about how ecosystems work. And then the idea here is that each of these different sites are uncovering uh, fundamental aspects of ecology that we can uh, synthesize our results across all of these different sites and drill down to uh, principles of ecology that are universal. And right? that's kind of the, the big, big idea there. And so what is the LTER? I've heard some people say it stands for lazy times, easy research. Not true. It stands for long-term ecological research. And it takes place in a landscape like this in McMurdo. And, and it's important to point out, like most times when you see a project with a big acronym, that means there's like one big project. And the, the LTER project here is a series of a bunch of smaller projects with their own event numbers, okay? And so I'm gonna call these out so there's like 
glacier crew, C504, they work on glaciers. They characterize how glaciers affect the ecosystem and the organisms that live there. There's a stream, a couple of groups that study streams. There's a group that studies these moats in the, in, in the melted out area parts of the lakes. And, and then there's uh, two teams that study the lakes. And then there's uh, the soils team. And this is the group that I'm affiliated with. We study the organisms that live in the soil, the biogeochemistry of the soil, and we're trying to figure out how these, uh, 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 how the soils work. But ultimately, the goal is to figure out how this entire ecosystem works, because each of these players up here are, are affected by each other, and they respond to each other, and they're connected to each other. Right? Glaciers melt, make streams. Streams accumulate stuff from the the soils. The soils run into the moats. The moats are connected to the lakes. So it's, so it's a big ecosystem of trying to characterize. And it's a bigger project than like just one individual investigator can sort of head up. And so we pool our resources, our teams, our brains, our data, and try and answer bigger <coughs> questions. So that's the LTR. That's what I'm doing down here. Meh. So at this point, you're like, meh, whatever. Like, why is this a big deal? And so I'm just going to point out that if you care about life on Earth, it's kind of a big deal. Okay, so if you care about like clean water, clean air, healthy ecosystems, fertile soils, that kind of stuff, we're studying that kind of stuff, right? At very basic levels, we're studying how these work, how ecosystems provision our planet with 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 services that that are important to sustaining life on Earth. So, man, it's kind of a big deal. Right? So it's another man. Meh, you got worms in my backyard, dude. Why you gotta go to Antarctica? That's me. And so here's here's the deal with why we go to Antarctica. First, these are very simple biotic communities. You go out in your backyard, you hold up a pull up a handful of soil, and you've got hundreds of thousands of individual organisms in your hand, maybe 10, 15, 20, 30 species of nematode worms alone. Right? And so trying to characterize how each of those players in the ecosystem interact and how changes in their abundances and diversity affect each other, but it's, it's way off the charts too hard to do. Down here in Antarctica, it's much simpler. Um, they, they're very uh, sensitive to climate variation, right? So the difference between a, a raging river down here and a frozen block of ice is one degree, right? The difference between zero and one degree Celsius. Right? So they're very, very sensitive to changes that turn on the ecosystem and can turn it off. And then they're relatively undisturbed. For a long, long period of time, these ecosystems look just like they do now, have looked just like they do now. And the only disturbances that you see there are caused by humans, like science humans, and humans that live really far away, the ones that are burning coal and stuff. Right? And so think about it, there's never been any indigenous Antarcticans. No humans ever lived down here. You didn't have humans like pooping and peeing on stuff and plowing things and burning things down like you do on all the rest of the planet. So these ecosystems are the most undisturbed by humans in the world, right, on our planet. And then the only changes, the only ecological disturbances that are caused by humans down here are disturbances that are generated someplace else on the planet. So it's a terrific place to study this sort of stuff. And the simple ecosystems make it so that we can look at the number of species that are in our ecosystem and, and we can manipulate those. We can say how many species and what of functions of these species do you have to have in order to have a sustainable ecosystem. Sort of like playing Jenga, right? Like imagine that each one of these blocks is a species in your ecosystem. How many of those blocks can you pull out before it collapses? How many species can you remove from an ecosystem before the ecosystem collapses, right? And, and we could do those types of manipulation experiments in a greenhouse, right? And then all my colleagues would be harshing on me saying, yeah, cool system, bro, it's a greenhouse. It's not a real ecosystem. But down here in Antarctica, nature has set this experiment up for us where it's controlled for high diversity, right? There's not a lot of diversity. And one of the best things, apologies to botanists out there, but one of the best things about this ecosystem, no plants, dude. We don't have like plants taking stuff out of the atmosphere and sticking it into the soils and screwing stuff up and making things complicated for us. So it makes it a lot easier for us to figure out how soils work without involving plants. So why should I care about Antarctic soil? Well, if we know how these soils in Antarctica responded to climate-driven changes in very simple uh, models, then we can figure out how they may do it in the future, right? So that's important. But we really still don't have a clue about how these ecosystems responded to the major climate changes, right? The recession of the glaciers, the, 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 the emergence from the ice ages, right? 
And so here's a nice system where nature set up this experiment where all we have to do is go back in and measure it and look at how these changes occurred over time and, and, and understand this. But this is a complicated case, Maude. There are lots of ins, lots of outs, a lot of what have yous, right? So I'm gonna try to work through this and, and explain it to you, hopefully in a way that, that is understandable. So the charismatic megafauna of the Cretaceous, long time ago, was probably things like dinosaurs, right? The, it's hard to beat the cool factor of, of dinosaurs. Um, but ever since about 85 million years ago, 75 million years ago, these things have been gone. And uh, it's looked pretty much like that down here. Okay? So there's a massive, massive changes underway in these ecosystems. And so I sort of want to explain this in a, using a story. So uh, many of you may not be familiar with this film called The Big Lebowski. But in The Big Lebowski, this is starring Jeff Bridges as the dude. Here's a picture of the dude. And, and the dude just happens to have the exact same last name as this super rich guy who has this wife who owes a lot of money all over town <laughs> to some dangerous people. Okay, And then somehow she becomes kidnapped and the dude's rug gets soiled and then he's drawn into this dangerous underground of Los Angeles. Okay? Now the real mystery here is what happened to Mrs. Lebowski. What? She got kidnapped? Was she killed? Was she just hanging out waiting for things to get better? Okay, so I'm setting up this analog now for what happened to all the organisms in Antarctica, right? Were they kidnapped? Were they killed? Were they just hanging out for something to get better? We've got to solve this mystery. The only way we're going to do it is by doing some science down here, okay? So that's what uh, went from dinosaurs to this, right? And so what we have here, not really a kidnapping maybe, but a recolonization mystery. So we went from like supposedly having nothing on this planet or on this continent to then all of the organisms that we find down here now. We're going to solve this mystery. So what are the charismatic megafauna of terrestrial Antarctica now? For about the past 20 million years, it's looked like this. There's no more dinosaurs and stuff. You'll notice that here, here's, our, here's, here's my team out here collecting soil samples. What you'll also notice is the absence of things like palm trees and zebras and squirrels kangaroos and stuff like that. They're not here, right? Nothing, nothing, pretty much nothing alive above ground. And so I thought I'd uh, look at the, the 20 top most charismatic organisms on the planet, and you'll see things like tigers and lions that are really beautiful or impressive. The, uh, the pandas really went out there on the cute factor there. The, the koala <laughs> bears are probably the champions in cuteness. What, what you'll notice on this list are probably nothing that you would find here in the Antarctic, unfortunately. So, what are the charismatic organisms of Antarctica? Well, penguins, they're cute. In the last 20 million years, they figured out how to get around down here. They've uh, sort of evolved some really clever ways of swimming through the water, flying through the water, actually. Um, but are they terrestrial megafauna? Now, when we find them on the continent, they look like this. Penguins, cute, right? Adorable. They are not inhabitants of terrestrial Antarctica. They live out in the ocean, they eat up shrimp and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're not animals of the continent, really. They're marine birds, right? Seabirds. Uh, we got seals, they're cute, right? Aww. Aww. In the dry valleys, they look like that. Aww. Yeah. That's no place for a seal in the dry valleys. The, the seals belong in the ocean, right? You get them up in the dry valleys, it's a tough place for them. So, uh, seals and penguins, not what I would call charismatic megafauna of terrestrial Antarctica. So really what we're left with, the animals that survived are gonna be these things. Oh, aren't those beautiful? <laughs> Nematode worms, and so these are organisms that are really tiny, microscopic, maybe a whopper, a really big one would be about a millimeter long. But they're at the very top of the food chain in these ecosystems. So you gotta take your mind out to the, to the oceans out here in the Ross Sea, the top of that ecosystem would be things like killer whales, and leopard seals, and, and these are the killer whales and leopard seals of terrestrial ecosystems in Antarctica. Really important players in those ecosystems. Very top of the food chain. Uh, another organism there, aww, aww, aww right? <laughs> Tardigrades, uh, uh, they, they live there, they're really cute. Um, and they're tough. 
Now you think tardigrades are tough because we can send them in outer space and bring them back down here and they're still alive and all that jazz. But dude, if you're passing eggs that look like that, now you're talking <laughs> tough, right? That's a tough organism right there, no question. Tough, yeah? And so I just got a little, you want to see one in action? I made a little video here, soundtrack, you can see a tardigrade. So his head's up here, that little, little tail end down there, gut contents, all the yummy stuff he's been eating is right in here. And you'll see that I'm focusing the microscope through a focal plane from the head to tail, the animal's about maybe a millimeter long, less than that, probably about half a millimeter. And up here is his mouth. He's got these mouth parts that can poke and pinch and, and prod things and then suck stuff into his gut. Huh, cute? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. We also have rotifers. Oh, that's a cute animal, huh? That's better than koala any day. Uh, this, this is the, the head end here and the tail down here. They have these organ spinnerets that they can attach to a stream. They live in mostly aquatic environments like streams and lakes, you'll find them there. And uh, they can attach to rocks and stuff so they don't go float down the stream. And this is what a rotifer looks like in action. So you see an in action rotifer. So this is his head up here. And you can see that they have these super turbocharged spinners up here at the top that can make it a, a create an enormous amount of water flow. So the water comes flowing through here and it goes into its gullet. And you can see this chomping organ, is the organ down here, the chomps. You see that stuff go flying by? Pretty cool, right? Just makes huge vacuum cleaners sucking stuff down its gullet. That's an awesome, charismatic organism. <laughs> yeah. So we also have some microarthropods like these mites and these columbola. They're very rare. They're patchily distributed, but also really cool organisms that we can find down here. Now they're easy to spot. All you have to do is lift up a rock in a place that's kind of ephemerally wetted, and you might see some algae or something around the rock. You pick the rock up and you look on the bottom, and it's easy to spot. You can probably see it right now from where you're sitting. No, you can't, right? It's kind of hard. So I'll point it out to you. It's on that rock right there. It's about two millimeters long, right? About, there's that little dot. There's where I'll blow it up right there. You can see it. Aw. Now you might think it's hard to find, but once you have seen one of them, you have the search image, you can find them. But last year when we were in the Shackleton range, all the folks that were out helping us in the field, they got better at finding them than we were, right? So you can find that stuff once you have a search image. And this is what this looks like. This animal is uh, extremely rare. It's only found on three little rock outcroppings <coughs> at the mouth of the Shackleton Glacier on the entire planet. It's the only place we'll find this one organism. We're trying to figure out uh, uh, how it got there because the population genetics are telling us a funky story. Right? Aww. And so if you were to look at just a, a dish of these organisms that just came out of, out of a soil sample, you might see a community that looks like this. You can see a big nematode here, it's a big nice long one. That's a nematode that's a, 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 a predatory nematode, eats cyanobacteria as well. Here's another species of nematode here. There's a tardigrade, oh, just doing her thing, yeah. And then there's some rotifers that are oompa loompa through here. I can find one, I thought they were over here. There you go, I got a oompa loompa rotifer doing its thing. That's a shabby, huh? That's an ecosystem, and there are the, those. That's your charismatic megafauna of terrestrial Antarctica. Right there. All right. Now all these organisms have to adapt to a really, really harsh environment. So now I want to tell you how these, uh, these animals do what they do. Okay, so um, in order to survive being frozen, um, you got to deal with water crystals forming. Now, in your body, when, when the water in your cells freeze, it forms these ninja star things that will totally jack up your cells, right? And then you, your cells die, and then you got to go to the doctor and have something cut off. These animals get around that problem by getting all of the water out of their bodies so that they don't have any water in their bodies to freeze. Great idea, right? You, have, you get dried to a crisp, freeze dried, and then all you have to do is just add water later on when it's available. Shazam, man, you come back alive, right? Isn't that awesome? And then this is, you just uh, come back alive and you have a short period of time to have sex, reproduce, grow, have more babies, and it turns out that it might take a long time for you to do that. In fact, you probably cannot get that done in one summer. 
So our research has shown that it takes about seven summers in order for that nematode to grow up and have sex and have babies and die. It takes like seven years for that to happen. They're constantly frozen and then thawed. And maybe a year later, thawed again. Right, there's my little tardy day. Not any cute, man. I know, right? How can you talk about that? This is the cutest thing. I think there should be like teddy bears and stuff. Okay? But then, of course, you finish every video with something like that because we all got huge egos and stuff. We're scientists, right? That's how we roll. All right, that's not bad. So, I thought I'd just talk briefly about how these organisms do this by telling you how they survive freezing. And so, if you really want to understand how the science of freezing works on cells, you go to folks like this, the Alcor Life Extension Foundation. Best slides I've found. This is, the, this is the company where you can send Ted Williams' head and put it in liquid nitrogen until someday we figure out how to clone bodies and put the brain back into it. So you can do that, but they've done lots of research there on what happens to these cells when they freeze. So here's a normal cell. You can see the water molecules are these big light blue ones, the dark blue ones, right? That's H2O. Yeah? And when, when it's nice and warm, the solutes and the water are all mixed up. But when it starts to freeze, the water molecules come together and they start to form these crystals pushing the solutes to the outside. Until when something's completely frozen, you got these big giant ice crystals here, you got the solutes to the outside, and that causes big problems in, in your, uh, that's gonna cause big problems to your cells. <laughs> and so here's what happens to your cells when they freeze, and they're warm, they're nice and happy, and when that water starts to freeze outside of the cells, it's sucking the water from these cells outside in order to feed those growing crystals. So you can see how it's gonna mess up the cells. Water freezing in the cells makes the ninja stars. It also sucks water outside of the cells and it causes the cells to be severely dehydrated. Okay, you gotta survive that. If your cells look like that, you're, you're not gonna be very happy. And so there are these adaptive strategies these organisms have evolved. And the two biggest challenges to living down here is water, you have to survive being frozen and then thawed and frozen and thawed, and you have to be able to survive being dried to a crisp, okay? Now the way that you get around that is you make antifreeze proteins in your cells, a cool thing, and then you also make cryoprotectants, we'll talk about those, and then your cells also need these big aquaporins, these are big tubes on the membranes of the cells that allow water to go out and to come back in really quickly. So. And you got to survive freeze drying, which is a combination of both of those. And so here's a nematode worm, a plectus, a beautiful animal. It's pretty happy. And then once you dry it out to a crisp, not very happy, right? So this is this this is a that same species of nematode, dry it to a crisp. There's a mom. There's a baby right there. Oh, see the baby? Oh, mom and baby kind of nuzzling. But they're both dried to a crisp. And then all you have to do is add water and they can take that water back into their cells and come back alive again. This is a really uh, clever strategy to survive these harsh conditions, but it also means that you can be blown around by the wind and land someplace and start a new, new life someplace, right? And so here's how this mechanism works. So here's the cell membranes. But when, when the water starts to freeze, you, the, which are these molecules here, the antifreeze proteins, will come and they'll bind to a growing ice crystal like that. So see those proteins come and bind to it. Once the proteins bind to the ice crystal, then now water molecules can't come and bind to it anymore. And so that effectively stops the growth of these crystals. Really clever idea. Um, we also have these big uh, aquaporin molecules that allow the water to go out very rapidly. And they also allow the water to come back in very rapidly once the animal can experience better conditions. And then we have these things called cryoprotectants. And some of these molecules are like sugar molecules, and they act just like water molecules, except they're like made out of glass. So when the water molecules are coming out of the cells, these sugar molecules are taking the place of the water molecules and stabilizing the contents of the cell. So the cell can be stabilized by these sugar molecules, and then when water comes back in, you just get the reverse swap out. The water molecules swap out with those, with these other uh, cryoprotectants. Pretty cool thing. And then there's heat shock proteins that are involved in, in shuttling those uh, and manufacturing these proteins and cryoprotectants. So, what? Did all the plants and animals go extinct in Antarctica with the during the ice ages? So. 
there are some hypotheses about the glaciation of this continent that suggest that they must have all gone extinct because our models of the glaciers show that there was this this part of the world was glaciated all the way out to the extent of the continental shelves right so you, there was ice all the way out you know almost south america right and of course you have these south america was all glaciated new zealand was glaciated right and so during the during the, the glacial maxima right so you have these glacial cycles where the it grows and it contracts grows and contracts and so during the last glacial maximum the glaciologists were telling us that that uh, this continent was entirely covered by ice and so all of the organisms that lived there had to have gone extinct and then recolonized later on right so these organisms got recolonized later on so they came from australia and new zealand and south america and they somehow recolonized that um, but you know those of us who are biologists we're studying these organisms and we study their evolutionary history and we can tell that they have a very distinct evolutionary history the species that live down here don't live anywhere else on the planet okay and so it's like would be crazy to think that somehow these species evolved 12,000 years ago like in the last 12,000 years you get all these new species like extremely unlikely so for like the last decade or so the biologists and myself I'm a biologist okay so we're all saying dude this is that this idea that the glaciologists have yeah. well, well you know I just like uh, your opinion man <laughs> right so when they tell us that all life here on the continent went extinct yeah we're just like saying yeah well that's just like your opinion man because we have a lot of evidence that suggests that these animals have survived multiple glacial cycles multiple glacial maxima these animals have been here for millions and millions of years and so somehow they survived that massive sheet of ice that completely completely covered this continent and so uh, there's lots of reasons to think that this is bogus okay because there are lots of species of, of these animals that live here nowhere else they evolved here they're endemics and their distributions and population genetics tell us that they've been here for a long period of time and so there are some hypotheses now about how they could have survived these they could have survived on these high elevation noon attacks so there were mountaintops that poked through the ice sheet that were not completely covered by ice that could have been you know there could have been soils there and stuff habitat for these organisms to survive there and so there's some reasons however to think that this idea is bogus and first of all the biodiversity at these new attacks is very low we don't find all this stuff way up at these new attacks now so if they could survive there during the last glacial maxima why would they be there now um, their current habitat is really lousy and there are some really cool papers coming out now showing that maybe geothermal areas like volcanoes that come through the ice they leave ice-free regions, they warm up the soil, they could be potential places where these organisms could have survived during the last glacial maximum. So uh, really clever papers where you can look at where, where the volcanoes and thermo, thermo, geothermal soils are, and sure enough, you can show that the, there's a correlation between biodiversity and where these volcano things are, right? I'll just point out there's also a correlation between that and where people go to study this stuff. And so there's some other reasons to think that this stuff is bogus, right? Um, first of all, these animals have distributions that are not found where these, uh, where these volcanoes are. In fact, I mean, the, there's diversity in the Transantarctic Mountains actually increases the further away you get from these volcanoes, right? Which sort of doesn't support this volcano hypothesis. So we really need to, survive, to, to, to figure this story out. We need to drill down and learn more about this noon attack stuff. So um, if you want to go study these things, in the, if you really want to dive into this, you start feeling like I do, right? So at this point, man, I'm calling out the glaciologists and the geologists. And then the glaciologists and geologists are saying, shut up, Byron. Like, you're out of your element, dude. You have no context here. You don't understand the history of this continent. And it turns out they're mostly right. Right? And so in order to answer these questions, you have to make friends with glaciologists and geologists 
who can then show you how these landscapes are overprinted, right? And, and tell you what the context is that is so that you can look at your biology in different ways, right? So that, that was me, right? I was out of my context. So we had an experiment last year to study this down in the Shackleton region uh, 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 of the Transantarctic Mountains. And we were looking at these places. So this is a schematic diagram here, right? Where there are these mountain peaks. This, this dotted line that you can see here is the extent of the glacier during the last uh, glacial maxima. The blue line there is the current extent of the glacier. And so you can see that there are these mountain peaks like Mount Nelson and Mount Frank that uh, currently stick out above the glacier, but before were completely subsumed by that glacier, right? And so what we're doing is we're going to each of these places and we're looking at the soil ecosystems above and below the, 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 the LGM trend line, of where, that, where that maximum part of the glacier was, to see how the new real estate that opened up when the glacier receded was recolonized, right? To see how these communities became reassembled. Right, so that's what we did. This is how we kind of wanted to do it. There's some models there for doing it. Uh, we, we, we sampled up above and below those trim lines, and we're finding some really cool things. So th these are just the places that we went along the Shackleton in order to do this. And um, so if we look at the bacteria that came from these, uh, uh, from these locations, you can see that the high elevation sites that are the highest latitude sites also, nearest to the pl plateau, you find that there's like an absence of living things there, right? And as you descend down the glacier, and also as you descend in elevation from these locations, from higher elevations to lower elevations at the same feature, that you start to see increases in the diversity, uh, both biodiver biological diversity, but also functional diversity, like what these organisms are doing in these ecosystems, and until you get right down to the very bottom of the glacier near the outlet. If you look at the animals, you'll see also a very similar trend, right? Where you see there are very few animals up near the polar plateau. As you make your way down the polar plateau, you start to pick up more and more of these, uh, more and more diversity. The ecosystems become more complex, and they're functionally redundant. They start to become biologically uh, more complicated. And so th that's just some really simple, that's sort of just Klein kind of stuff that you would sort of predict going into it. We're really excited now about looking at the relationship between biodiversity and functioning. So uh, is the kidnapping of a problem completely solved? Uh, no, it's not completely solved. We're still working on it, but we think we've got some great ideas to test and to, to sort this stuff out. And well, I didn't want to make you sit, sit through any more of this stuff, so I thought that I would end this here and I could take questions if you have them. Yes. Um, I know there's been some experiments with long-term freezing and reanimation of things like tardigrades, but my question is how long those have gone on for, and if they have, if there's like cellular breakdown associated with that, so it would show that there's some sort of limit of how long they can go on for. That, that's, so the question was, you know, do we know, let, let me paraphrase, hopefully I get it right. The question was, like, we know that these animals can, like, live in freezers, but how long can they be frozen in like a block of ice and still survive? And, and what about their cellular you know, the, the damage and can it be regenerated? And the answer to that question is we really don't know how long they can survive in a block of ice because as long as we've had them in blocks of ice, they've been able to survive, okay? So I've been coming down here 16 years and I can still take stuff out from 2003 out of my minus 80 fridge, freezer, and I can thaw it out and I can watch it come alive under a microscope. So this, this is an important component of understanding how these organisms survived the Pleistocene. Because one, one hypothesis would be they could have just been flo frozen in a block of ice for 28,000 years, right? And then thawed out and then they come to. And so that's actually one of the hypotheses we're able to test with our Shackleton data. So that, that's what we're sort of looking at with that. Um, but, but in terms of like their ability to regenerate, um, it's not, that we, we don't know that much that they're able to like repair their cells. Um, I, I didn't say this about the rotifers when I was showing you the rotifers. Somewhat scandalous story there. No sex for 30 million years, okay? And so the rotifers, right, evolutionarily that shouldn't happen, right? You should go extinct if you're not having sex because you're not generating genetic variation. You can't respond to changes in your environment. But the rotifers that come, come to find out how they do this 
is that they're able to take exogenous DNA from their environment and just stick it into their genome. And that's where they get their genetic variation. And so they have these crazy DNA repair mechanisms that are used to stick that in there. So DNA repair may play an important role in how these organisms survive that stuff or come to afterwards. Yeah, great question. Yeah? Have you looked for any fossils? Ha have we looked for fossils? And the answer is yeah. I, I would love to find lots of fossils of these things. It's very challenging to find fossils because they're all soft-bodied animals. So they don't have like shells or teeth or bones or things like that that fossilize very well. So just in general, we know very little about these soft-bodied soft organisms. Yeah. yeah. Is there any way to determine their age? That's a great question. Is there a way to determine their age? And the answer is like, well, yeah, that's just carbon data, dude. And we'll figure out how old they are. But the problem with that is that this ecosystem runs on fossil fuels. So if I could explain. The, the dry valleys, uh, a lot of these places in the dry valleys, when the West Antarctic ice sheet was at its maximum, it blocked up the ends of all of these valleys and made these huge paleo lakes. And those lakes were really productive. Lots of, lots of phytoplankton being fixed, carbon being fixed into plant material. And then it all lands down at the bottom of these lakes. Well, now the lakes have all dried out. And so what these soil ecosystems are eating is that carbon that was made 65,000 years ago. So when I take my worms and I carbon date them, they're eating carbon that's 65,000 years old. And that's going to tell me a worm that was born a week ago is 65,000 years old. So it complicates things, makes, makes things difficult to date down here. I would love to, to do that. And I've been trying to figure out a way that I can get around that problem. And there are some ways to do it because the plants, if, if they're eating, can, uh, uh, we can talk about that later, but the, there are, I'm, I'm trying to figure out ways that I can get around that problem. Yeah. So what about in ice cores or are there any places where we drill ice cores that go all the way to the surface and then you could sample surface material and are these organisms present in that? That's a great question. The question was, what about if we drill through the ice into the rock and sediment below that, and we bring that up and we study it, well, maybe there would be live things in there. And so there have been a few attempts to do this where they take these cores through the permafrost, and not you don't even have to go through ice, right? You just go out there, and some of the oldest ice on the planet is like just under your feet. And so they take these zipper drills and they, they take cores out, and then they try and characterize them. They haven't found animals. The people that I know are doing this haven't found animals alive there. But they found microbes that are there. And the microbes are viable. They're, they're able to you know, take that old stuff from the permafrost and grow these things again. So, you know, it, it would make sense that we would find now. Now, just anecdotally, we had an experiment up at the top of Mount Faulkner a, a while ago where I was chipping out permafrost that was maybe like 15 centimeters deep. And I brought it back to the lab and we thawed it out and there's all these worms just super happy crawling around in it. It makes you wonder, like, when was the last time there was liquid water there? When was the last time that permafrost was thawed out? Could have been a really long time ago, but we just don't know. So those are great questions that we would like to figure out someday, but they're, they're hard questions. All right, thank you very much.